Okay. Um, excellent. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very, very excited for this. Um, my name's Charlie. I'm here to talk about rough. Um, I, I don't really give a lot of talks. Um, and I, I definitely don't give a lot of talks to rust oriented or rust specific audiences. Um, so this is, this will be entirely new material. Um, which is good and bad probably. Uh, it's good in that it'll be totally original and uh, you're all the first people to see all of this content. Uh, it's bad in that I'm sure it will feed and that I'm trying to cover too many disparate topics, but I uh, will find something interesting. Um, the way that I've structured this talk is, um, you know, I think I think sort of like what rough is, is probably the, the least interesting uh, thing to people here, they're probably more interested in, in how it works and how it was built. But I am going to start by talking a little bit about uh, what Rough is and uh, how it came to be created. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, how Rough works. And then at the end, I want to go deep on performance and some of the specific things that we've done uh, in Rough to, uh, to improve performance. Um, because I was looking back at my old code, and this is where I found all the really interesting things I've learned over the past year or so working on Rough. Um, so the talk will get increasingly specific as we go on. And at the end, we're going to look at some, some actual code and talk about very specific changes that we made in Rough, um, the impact that they had, and, uh, and why. OK, so uh, let's start by talking uh, just briefly about what Rough is. Um, so I have this line in the front, uh, an extremely fast Python linter. Uh, written in Rust. Uh, so Rough is a linter. It lints Python code. Um, so it looks for problems like unused imports, unused variables, um, but it can also do things that are um, a little bit more, I guess, advanced than that. So it can do that kind of semantic analysis, but it can also make suggestions like, oh, you're using an old syntax to express this idea. Um, you, you can use this newer syntax. And it will also automatically uh, rewrite your code. So if you've written Rust before and you've used Clippy, Clippy uh, has a pretty powerful like auto fixing and code rewriting system. Uh, Rough does a lot of that too. So it's really seen as a linter and a code transformation tool. Um, importantly, Rough is like entirely written in Rust, um, but it's installable uh, through pip. So you don't need to have Rust installed uh, to use it. It distributes like any other Python package. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, as we go on. Uh, Rough is, uh, in a very short time, has grown to be used by a very large um, number of projects. So the first commit to Rough was, um, I think, in August of 2022. So it's been a little under a year. Um, and it's now in use by uh, a bunch of big companies. Uh, I would say like most of the sort of bigger Python projects that you might have heard about or seen on GitHub. Um, so in a very short period of time, uh, we shipped this weird Rust-based <laughs> like Python linter tool, and uh, people really gravitated towards it. Um, and uh, th this chart's actually really dated. This is from when I did our company announcement post, but we're now, um, I mean, this is just GitHub stars, but we're now above the the top of the y-axis on this graph. <laughs> um, I guess the other important thing that Rough is, is, is to me, Rough is um, the first tool in a tool chain. So Rough is a linter, but uh, it's also kind of an embodiment of this idea that we could make uh, very different Python tooling. Um, and in this case, very different meant, uh, meant a few different things that I'll talk about, but uh, one obvious one is performance. So uh, to me, rewriting uh, this linter stack in Rust created this tool that uh, really resonated with people and, and and clearly a lot of people found it useful and valuable. Um, I started a company, Astral, based on that idea. Our goal is to build more Rough-like things. So we're trying to build more Rust-based Python tooling. So where did Rough like, come from? Why did I uh, build this thing? I, I think I'll answer this by answering a slightly different question, which is where I came from, like what's my background? Um, so I started my career at a company called Khan Academy, which is an education technology company. Um, and there I worked on a lot of things that were not Rust. So I did a bunch of web front end, um, like a lot of JavaScript. I did some web back end in Python. I did like a year 
ish of Android when we started building or Java, you know, when we started building our first Android applications, um, I did a little bit of iOS. Um, so I worked across a bunch of different programming ecosystems on like a bunch of totally different things, just kind of, I think, hopefully learning to be like a somewhat competent generalist software engineer. Um, after that, I joined a company called Spring Discovery, which is a computational biology company. And this was like totally different work. I was building um, a lot of machine learning infrastructure. So that was all Python. Um, a lot of data infrastructure that was primarily Python. And then at the end, uh, started to be this sort of hybrid Rust and Python uh, uh, code base. Um, and again, I was, I was doing a lot of front end, um, this time in TypeScript. And uh, there were a couple things that led to me starting to work on a rough, um, as I said, in August, 2022. Um, so, you know, I guess the first is like, I, I wouldn't say I've had like a, a, a super long career or anything, but I have worked on um, in a bunch of different programming ecosystems. And I think that influences how I think about tooling. I look at things that certain ecosystems do really well. And then when I move between stacks, I find that I'm missing things. Um, and uh, in this case, even I felt like web tooling or Rust tooling when I was coming back to Python, uh, I was I was feeling frustrated with some of the edges that I was running into and the inability of the tooling to scale uh, to our project, which um, you know wasn't enormous but was big enough that things like our linter, our type checker, um, you know, we were having to really become experts in how to do package management in Python, and and all those things to me felt a little bit off. Um, I think the other things that contributed to me. Uh, sort of thinking about uh, building Rough was that we started to use Rust at Spring, as I mentioned, um, and that was a totally new thing for me. If it, I think this this sort of resume shows, like I do not have like a systems programming background by any means. I wrote some C in college, but um, I've never written any C plus um, plus. I've never written any like professional grade C, um, and so Rust was a really new thing to me. It was my first brush with all like a systems programming language. Um, and so getting exposed to that at work, it, it was just interesting that it felt accessible, even if I didn't really understand the language, that I could kind of build stuff in this new language and I could build programs with like really, really different characteristics from the things I was used to building. Um, and then I guess the other thing I started to see was that more and more tooling, especially in the web, was being written um, in not JavaScript. So like more and more JavaScript and web tooling was being written in uh, Go or Rust or Zig. And I started thinking about whether we could apply those same ideas to Python tooling. So could we build Python tooling in not Python, I guess is the way to put it. Um, and uh, what would that look like? How different would it be? And Rough was my attempt to uh, answer some of those questions and honestly, to learn Rust. Like I, I didn't start Rough with the intention of um, turning it into the project that it's become um, and certainly not turning it into a company. Um, I really started rough with the goal of trying to learn Rust and get better at Rust um, and also see if I could prove out some of these ideas around building uh, really different Python tooling. In March-ish, I guess I started, I think we publicly announced the company in April, um, but I started a company, Astral, uh, which is really based around the ideas of rough. So we're now a team of, um, geez, a team of five and, and uh, we're working to continue building um, hopefully really great Python tooling. So building more rough and building more rough like things. I guess the other thing that I want to point out just by talking through this history is um, I've only been writing Rust for like about a year. So I, I suspect there are people in this audience who are like a lot more knowledgeable than me on Rust and on like specific topics on which I'm going to opine. Uh, but I still see myself very much as like on my own Rust learning journey. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail, but Rust to me is really an amazing language, but I think it's also a language you can like learn many times over. The Rust I write now is like it's completely different from the Rust I wrote a year ago. And hopefully the Rust I write in a year will be completely different from the Rust I learned now. So uh, my first slide was talking about what is rough. Um, to me, that's also not really like a super interesting question. I think the more interesting question is like, what makes rough good? I talked about how like a lot of people are using rough. What's interesting about it? Um, so 
the kind of headline feature is that Rough is just really fast compared to um, a lot of the other existing tools. Um, so we have this benchmark in our README. Um, I think this is dated because I, I think we're actually faster than this, but, um, but this is the thing that I have nice and pretty and laid out and measured. Um, so this is Rough. Uh, running as compared to a bunch of other tools, um, just with its default configuration, no caching, nothing like that. Um, so Rough is is really comparatively very fast. Um, I have this nice, I don't know if we're calling this a tweet still or not, but I have this nice note from Nick Schrock, um, uh, who's the, the co-creator of GraphQL. He runs a company called Elemental. And he talks about how rough it for them was a thousand times faster. So on their code base, it used to take two and a half minutes uh, on his local machine to run Pylint, and now Rough runs in, I guess, 400 milliseconds. And he had another, there's another tweet in this thread where he talks about how on CI, they would like parallelize across all 70 Python packages that they publish. They would run like a separate CI job, and now the whole thing runs as a pre-commit hook. So Rough is like fast enough that the ergonomics of using it are very, very different from other tools that you might switch from. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, what makes Rough fast? Because I think that's a very interesting question. Second thing that I think makes Rough good and interesting is that uh, I use this word like unified. So uh, the thing that we tend to see is that people come in with um, uh, requirements.txt, basically dependency lists that look something like this. They have like a ton of different dependencies that are, this is all static analysis code quality tooling that's either like linting or import sorting or doing something or formatting or doing something else. Um, and then they come out with something like this. This is like a real thing from the Discord. So they went from like, I don't know, like 30 dependencies to like just using rough and their auto formatter. And we're actually working on a, a rough auto formatter. So maybe this will become just rough soon. Um, but uh, the point is rough, uh, it, it sort of bundles um, a lot of the things that you might want in your linter that would traditionally be all be done by separate tools in Python. Um, so like import sorting, for example. Python typically uses a separate tool for that called iSort, uh, but Rough just treats import sorting as a lint rule. Um, and so Rough can replace your import sorter. Um, and that same logic applies to just a bunch of other tools. So one nice thing that people see is it like really, really simplifies their, um, not just their dependency list, but uh, they only have to learn like this one tool and it uh, has all this different functionality bundled into it, which is something that people uh, seem to appreciate a lot. I mentioned this earlier, Rough does a lot of code, code transformation. So um, it's not just uh, flagging errors, it can also um, automatically fix them for you. So this is just an example from something I was doing uh, like over the weekend. <laughs> um, in Python, if a, uh, if a variable or an import is only used as a type annotation, um, there are actually ways to avoid having to import it, which can make your code faster at runtime and reduce dependencies. Because here, for example, you actually don't need to import pandas to, to run this file. You just need pandas because you need to use the type annotation. And so Rough can actually like identify imports and variables that are only used in typing contexts, and it can move them into these typing only blocks, and it can quote the annotations and do all this transformation for you automatically. So um, we're trying to get like more and more advanced over time with the kinds of, this is in addition to things like removing unused imports, which um, uh, are comparatively much simpler. Um, but over time, Rough is trending towards being uh, a more and more powerful code transformation tool. So you kind of plug it into your stack, and not only does it identify a bunch of problems, but it, it, it can hopefully can fix most of them too. And then lastly, um, I mean, all the other Python linters, like thankfully have this property too, but uh, I guess it's worth mentioning because Rough is written in Rust. Um, so Rough doesn't have any dependencies, like it doesn't depend on Rust um, to use it. You just install it with pip. Um, we ship uh, basically a single executable binary and that gets packaged as a Python package using a tool called Matrin. Um, so uh, uh, th this is actually, to me, a very cool property. You actually don't even have to install Python to use Rough. Um, so you can just drop in like a Rough executable anywhere and run it anywhere. Um, and it's just a standalone uh, piece of software that you can install and use just like if it was written. Um, well, if you're used to Python, then it just feels like you're using something else from the Python stack as opposed to being written in Rust. So let's talk a little bit about um, how Rough works. And um, 
I feel like I'm going to do a really bad job with this section because I'm going to try and cover what I think are a lot of interesting ideas. Um, but uh, you can give me feedback afterwards about whether or not any of this makes sense. Um, so Rough is about 150,000 lines of Rust split across 20 crates. And it's really structured as um, uh, the language here is very intentional. It's, it's structured as sort of a traditional batch compiler. So you can view it as a compiler that like takes in Python source code and outputs diagnostics. Um, I guess it also transforms Python source code, but let's just run with that sort of simple framing. Um, so if you think about Rough as a compiler, like this, the Rough uh, sort of compilation pipeline looks like this. We first discover all the Python projects in, uh, sorry, all the Python files in your project. Um, sounds very simple, actually kind of complicated because we support this sort of, uh, any file could have a different configuration. We support like hierarchical configuration. So you could lint a monorepo, lint a bunch of different project packages. They could all have different configurations. So as we traverse over your project, we have to sort of map the configuration. And then uh, we have a very, very simple model, which is that for every single file in parallel, uh, we lint it. And that means read the file from disk, tokenize it and parse it. So break it down into uh, tokens like keywords and variable names, uh, parse it so we can identify. This creates the abstract syntax tree, if you're familiar with that. So we get um, a representation of like, what are the function definitions? What are the imports? Um, what are the function calls? And then we analyze that. Uh, that tokenized and parsed representation. So we have lots of different, we support lots of different kinds of lint rules and like the inputs that they take are, can be different. So for example, um, we have some lint rules that only need to look at comments. Like if you wanna make sure that um, a Python script has a shebang, um, you only have to look at comments. So you don't actually need the abstract syntax tree for that. You just wanna look at all the comments in the program. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some rules that are just based on the token stream, which is like things like comments or like individual, um, uh, pieces of syntax in the program. Uh, and then we have a bunch of rules that are based on traversing and understanding the syntax tree um, and doing semantic analysis at the same time. So semantic analysis would be uh, for things like um, unused imports. So to understand whether an import is unused, you need to be able to do it a couple things. You have to be able to traverse the Python, the AST, uh, identify the imports, and then keep track of them as you traverse over the rest of the AST. So you're trying to see, was this import referenced here? Was it referenced here? Was it referenced anywhere? Um, so we traverse over the AST. Um, we kind of build up this model of what are all the symbols? What are the function definitions? What are the variables? Where are they defined? Um, what are the imports? Uh, and then what's used where? Um, so you could think of about this in the context of the example I showed before of like moving and quoting that pandas data frame type annotation. Um, we, need to, we need to do like a lot of semantic analysis to support that because we need to know uh, what are all the symbols that were imported? Where were they used? Were all, all the places that it was used, were those only type annotations? And then when we wanna fix it, we need to know what are all the locations in the code where it was referenced, which of those need to be quoted. Uh, we had to import something the from typing import type checking thing to move the import. Um, so the point is there's a lot of analysis that has to happen in order to support those kinds of rules. And that's where the bulk of the, um, uh, the bulk of the complexity and the sort of quote unquote linter lives is in traversing that AST, building up a model of what's happening in the code and then enforcing rules on it. After we like generate all the rules, we apply any of those automatic fixes. Um, and uh, we have a really, really simplistic model, which is that if we apply a fix, we just relint the file. Because you can imagine that like, if you have an import that's used in one place, and then for whatever reason, we've removed that usage, like, oh, that's a, not an expression that's ever gonna, that's not a function that's ever gonna be called, and we remove it, suddenly you're left with an unused import. And so the way that we saw, basically fixing one lint rule can lead to other lint rules being surfaced. Um, and because we have this uh, implementation where every rule operates independently, uh, Rough just has a super simple model of if, a, if we apply a fix, we just like rerun Rough entirely over that file until it converges. Um, and uh, obviously that could, uh, if you have a, a bad rule, um, you could end up running Rough infinitely. We have a sort of cap of how many times you run it. And then we spit out a nice link to our issue tracker asking you to file a bug if you have some sort of infinite loop in your fixer. Um, but this is a really, really simple model. We lint every single file independently and we just lint and fix files until convergence. 
Uh, and then at the end, we print out all the, di the remaining diagnostics. So we might, you know, and that, uh, that'll include code frames. So we'll say like this import was unused. Here's what it looks like in the code, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is like really, really simple or not simple, but um, it's certainly not simple, but it's high level description of how rough works today. Um, I think one interesting thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately, um, and this is weird because I'm like, I don't know that I'm trashing my own tool, but I think a lot about like how rough could work. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny for me because I started working on rough. Um, I didn't really know anything about building tooling like this. And so I just set off to like build a linter. Um, and since then I've learned a lot more about building tooling like this. And I've looked at a lot of other projects. Um, I think the two that I tend to draw, um, I guess the most inspiration are sort of learning from with regards to like the high level design are uh, Rust Analyzer, if anyone has used that. It's like the VS Code, typically used in VS Code. It's a Rust language server. So it sits in your editor and it handles like auto completion um, and a ton of other stuff. Super impressive piece of software. So I think about Rust Analyzer. And then I think about a project called Rome, which was, uh, which is a, um, uh, a unified, uh, tool chain for the web. So it's like JavaScript, TypeScript, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, also written in Rust. And they have, uh, that I think is an extremely well-designed piece of software and uh, has a lot of similarities to Rust Analyzer. Um, but I wanna talk for a second about things that uh, Rough doesn't do that like those pieces of software do that are kind of interesting to me and, and, and may hint towards like what we want Rough to be in the future. So the first is that, I talked about how Rough is a batch compiler. Um, this is as opposed to uh, what I've seen called like a query-based compiler. And this is the kind of thing that you would want for a language server. So imagine that you're a Rust analyzer and you're living, you're sitting in um, the IDE. So someone like opens up a, uh, someone opens up a Rust file and uh, there's a couple things that you like don't want to happen. <laughs> so one is that you don't want to have to analyze like their entire project and code base in order to provide like any information. Um, the other is that when they start editing the file, you don't want to have to rerun all of your analysis in totality just to provide updated uh, information and inference. Like when someone opens a file in Rust Analyzer, um, you want it to be highly incremental. So you want to say like, what's like the minimum information I need to provide context on like what's happening in this file. And similarly, when someone edits a file, you want to do like the minimum amount of work um, required to get to new insights. Um, that's like a really, really different model from how Rough works. Rough has none of that incrementality built into it today. It is every time that you run Rough, uh, we basically analyze your project from scratch. That's like a really different model from something like a language server. And um, Alex Kladov or Matt Clad, who wrote Rust Analyzer, um, I mean, he has like the greatest blog of all time. If you're interested in learning Rust, like every single post on that blog is worth reading. Um, but he's also done this whole video series about how a Rust Analyzer works. And um, the biggest takeaway for me is that like building something like a language server is really different from a traditional compiler because of these ergonomics. It's a long lived piece of software that's like sitting in the editor and you're always trying to do this incremental work. Um, Rough does not work like that today and maybe it will someday. Uh, but to me, that's like a really interesting um, uh, design problem and constraint for software, like building a language server versus a traditional compiler. Very, very different. Um, I guess the other thing that, is worth mentioning there that I'm realizing I don't think is on the slide anywhere is that um, like Rust Analyzer, for example, can parse invalid programs. So think about when you're like typing in your editor, like you're introducing a lot of invalid states, like as you're in between syntaxes, like you're starting a function call, you hit the open parentheses, you hit save. Like Rust Analyzer does a good job of trying to parse the program, even if it's not syntactically valid. Like it, it basically makes its best effort at understanding what the syntax is trying to be. Um, and then it provides diagnostics based on that. Uh, Rough does not do that. Rough can only parse valid programs. So uh, again, I'm kind of talking down my own work, but there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can see in these other pieces of software that I think Rough could become. Um, we only work on Python files. We also support like Jupyter notebooks, which are um, a little bit different, but it's 
still ultimately parsing Python source code. That's as opposed to something that would be language agnostic. Um, Rough only operates on uh, the AST and the token stream. We don't use uh, what's commonly called a CST, which would be like a concrete syntax tree. Um, this is kind of a small thing, but Rust Analyzer, for example, um, uses a CST, which means that like everything in the code is captured in the AST, like comments and white space. Our representation, the RAST, doesn't capture those. Um, this mostly impacts rough internals and not externals, but it's again just one difference between where I think rough could become or how uh, like Rome and Rust Analyzer works. Um, we also do this like rerun until convergence thing, which means that every time we edit your file with an autofix, we then uh, reparse the file. So like we removed an import and now we have to reparse the whole thing. Um, that's like super inefficient. Because you can imagine a fixed model where you're actually changing the syntax tree. Like imagine that instead of removing the import and then reparsing a file, you just remove the import from, from that abstract syntax tree or that concrete syntax tree. Then you don't need to reparse. You just reanalyze and reanalyze. So these are kind of like idealistic things that I think about sometimes with when I think about how rough could be designed differently, which is a weird thing to include in the talk, but I think helps point out some of the things that makes this kind of working on these kinds of prod problems quite interesting. All right, so rest of the time, I wanna focus on like what makes rough fast. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the sort of high level, um, some of the high level properties of rough. And then uh, I've queued up um, a bunch of specific PRs that we made uh, that made rough faster. And I kind of wanna talk through uh, what those are and, um, uh, like why they made Rough faster and what the lessons were. Um, I don't know how many we'll get through. We'll kind of see when it starts to feel like really boring because I think I probably queued up too many, but um, but uh, we'll just see how long it remains interesting. Um, and I guess I'll be the judge of that. So the first thing that makes Rough fast as compared to a lot of other tools um, is uh, we parse once. So we have unified tooling, which means that we only need to like parse your, well, ignore the fact that we might reparse it after we fix it. <laughs> In general, we parse once. So uh, Rough does a lot of different stuff. If you look at that, uh, that first screenshot of like, oh, I'm using 20 or 30 different Python static analysis tools, many of those have to parse the code themselves or come up with their own intermediate representations of the code. So for example, if you're using like flake eight as your linter and isort as your import sorter, and then pydoc style as your doc string linter, each of those are gonna end up parsing your Python source code, um, even though they could benefit from the same intermediate representations of it, like that abstract syntax tree. Um, so, it's not just that rough is like faster than any one tool. It's also scales very well as we add more functionality to it as compared to adding more tools. Like it's very hard. Uh, like if you, if you just look at like a standard Python um, static analysis tool chain and look at all the different tools and count up how many times it's going to like lex parse, read the source code from disk. It's, it's, it's a lot. And rough does that one time and then gets to benefit from that shared representation. So, uh, similarly, we're working on an auto formatter now. We'll still parse your source code once. We'll parse your source code once. Um, and then we will like lint it, traverse it, format it without having to keep doing the expensive steps of reading from disk, parsing, lexing. So this is like inherent to the design, um, that you get good economies of scale from bundling tools together um, is how I would describe that. Uh, the other is that rough, I, I use this word around Rust before, this like fearless concurrency. Like we just have like a really, really parallel model. Um, and that comes with limitations. By parallel, I mean that every file, uh, I mean, we don't lint every file at once in parallel, but we can just completely parallelize the step of linting because every file is, is analyzed independently. Um, that introduces a bunch of constraints, but uh, my point is um, we can use a lot of parallelism and Rust's parallelism in my experience is like way more efficient than for example, Python's multiprocessing. Um, the other thing that makes Rust fast is just Rust. Uh, like, uh, and this is a little bit nuanced, like Rust is very fast, but like writing your program in Rust doesn't guarantee that it will be fast. It is definitely possible to write very slow Rust programs. Um, but Rust gives you an extremely high ceiling for performance. Like you can write extremely performance software. Um, and 
if if you're doing you know the exact same operations in like Python versus Rust, you should definitely expect the Rust version to be faster. And then Rust also just creates a totally different ceiling for how fast your program can be. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail. The other thing I've been thinking about a lot is like um, this idea of writing like performant Rust, I think is its own like area of expertise. And um, I'll kind of, I'll demonstrate this in a second with some examples, but um, uh, you know, you can look at the same code like a year on, two years on, and you'll just look at the performance characteristics of it in a totally different way. Um, there's just a lot to learn about like writing performant Rust. Um, and, uh, and not all of that is like specific to Rust. It's more um, specific to like data oriented programming or whatever you want to call it. It's like, how do you think about um, the stack versus the heap? How do you think about caches? How do you think about um, when it makes sense to like do repeated work versus using more memory? Like these are general principles, but Rust just gives you basically complete control over them. Um, and uh, that's extremely powerful. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm like the world expert in writing performant Rust, but like uh, I do think um, Rough has gotten a lot more performant over the past year, and I think my expectation is that will it will continue to get much faster uh, because of this. There's just such a high ceiling for how you can make uh, make your programs faster. Um, and the last thing is is really it's kind of cultural. It's like we just have a constant focus on performance, so you know we 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 constantly benchmark. Um, and that both means that we're like benchmarking on CI and whenever we think about a change that we think will improve performance, we, we will never make that change without data. So we're always looking at, uh, micro benchmarks. So, um, you know, let's just analyze this one file a zillion times and see what the percentage changes are. And then we'll look at macro benchmarks. So if we run, let's run rough over a large code base, like Apache Airflow and see how much change there is. We just... Uh, we have a very data-oriented approach to how we choose what to change and a very performance-oriented culture in code review. So even, even small things that almost certainly don't matter, we will think about them at the level of what's the fast, what's a fast way to do this? Where are we doing unnecessary work? Um, I guess one sort of aside, if you look at how Rough works today, these are it's like impossible to put numbers on these because it completely depends on the project, the size of the project, the settings, like rough supports like 600 rules. So, and most people do not enable them all, but if you enable them all, the numbers here change really dramatically. But I think this was with like the default configuration, which is a pretty, a pretty limited number of rules. And I think this was, I think I ran this over Apache Airflow, but if you look at like, and these numbers don't add up to hundred, by the way, I know that. <laughs> um, if you, but if you, if you look at this, like some time is spent, like basically doing a bunch of IO to find and read all the Python files. A lot of time is spent on tokenizing and parsing. And then a bunch of time is spent on actual analysis. Um, the rest of the time is like lost in various small places. It's like dropping, allocating and dropping memory, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the funny thing about this for me is that like this, this to me actually says like rough could be like way faster because we have spent by far the least time on uh, the parser the Lexer and the parser, where we're spending a lot of time, that is the place we have optimized the least. Um, and uh, so it's just kind of a funny observation that rough, rough is very fast, but I actually think that rough can be much faster than it is today. And I, I actually expect rough to get faster and not slower as we add more, more behavior to it. Okay, so um, I guess everything to now has been like a little bit high level, but I wanna talk about some things that make rough fast in practice. Um, and these will not be large architectural things, but these are, uh, these are small changes that we've made over time, uh, to make rough faster. And the motivation for this actually came from looking at this really old pull request. So this is from, I said, I started rough in August of 2022. This is from August 31st, 2022. Um, it's PR issue I guess PR number 53 and we're now on like 6,000. So this is like, this is like a really old change. Um, and, and it's not my pull request. This is a contributor contributing this change on top of code that I wrote. And um, what this code is doing is uh, it's trying to identify duplicate variables and function definitions. So if you had like uh, def foo a, a, 
like you use the variable name a twice in your function definition, this rule would catch that. Actually a strange rule because that's a, that is a parser error in Python. So I don't know why we had this rule or why we, maybe we still have this rule um, because I don't think that you can actually parse a Python program that will produce duplicate argument names, but we're not focused on that. That's not important. We're focused on what, what this is doing and how it's written. So uh, the way this code is structured is we, we're gonna iterate over all of the function arguments and we're just gonna put them in a hash set. And then if we see, that we found, uh, we, we've already seen an argument before, we're gonna add uh, a diagnostic that says, we found a duplicate argument, here it is, here's what the, the, the duplicate argument is. Um, and uh, this person came in um, and submitted a pull request that improved the performance of this check um, uh, quite significantly. And uh, uh, the way that they're doing it is that they're avoiding uh, these extra allocations um, by going from an own string to a, a, a string slice reference. Um, and this change, I'm going to talk about that specific change that they made here in more detail. But this to me was really interesting because I looked at this and I knew that at the time when I wrote the code, like this to me is a really, really obvious thing to do now. But at the time, I had no idea that like this would that this would be better performance. Like. Uh, sorry, that this would improve performance or that this was even like the same or allowed. Like I didn't know any of those things. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and uh, someone came put, and you know put together this PR and I was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. And I kind of learned this thing, we committed the change. But looking at this now, not only is like the first version that I wrote in red, like to me, very inferior, but I can see like a bunch of things you can do to improve performance of this even further. Uh, that were not obvious to me at the time, clearly, because I didn't do them. So I want to go through like seven different versions of this exact same function. And each one, uh, we're just going to talk about what's changed. And then I'm going to benchmark them all at the end. Um, uh, so uh, this is the first version of that function. Uh, it's, it's basically what was in red on the slide before. So we're looking for duplicates. We're taking in ignore. If you're a Rust expert and you have problems with specifics of this function signature, don't don't worry about it. It's not important for this. Um, but basically, we're, we're iterating over a slice of own strings, and uh, we're just going through each one and we're saying, is this in the set already? If so, we found a duplicate. Otherwise, put it in the set. So the first change, which was what we saw in that pull request, was that we switched. And I'll just go. I'm just going back and forth here a couple times. So this is the previous version, this is the new version. So the main thing is we switched from using an own string, that capital S T R I N G, to a reference, the and str. And that means we don't have to clone uh, the string down where we have seam.insert. So we went from having to uh, to clone, which means that uh, we're performing an allocation, to uh, just storing a reference to it. Um, allocating memory, pretty expensive. Um, and uh, this is one of the things we avoid uh, as much as possible in rough, we make very, very few allocations. Um, but in general, like if you can avoid allocations, you will tend to improve performance quite a bit because uh, right, allocating memory, again, is expensive compared to not allocating memory. Um, and so if you can do uh, things that you can do on references, uh, although it tends to make the code uh, more complex, you have to really like think in Rust because you're now thinking about references and ownership and like, I mean, you had to think about ownership before, but uh, avoiding allocations. This was like the first thing that you can do to make this thing faster. Um, the second thing, I wanna make sure I get the order right. Okay, the second thing you can do is if you understand the Rust's um, set and map APIs, I, I don't know what this is called, maybe like the entry API, um, you can actually do one fewer operation here. So here we're checking if the argument is in the set and then we're inserting it. But Rust API actually tells you whether an, ent an entry already existed in the set when you insert it. So rather than doing this contains and then insert, we can actually just do the insert. And if the thing was already in the set, Rust returns false, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's not true. I'm pretty sure it returns false. Anyway. Um, uh, the point is we're doing a bunch of needless work because to do this versus this, um, we have to hash the string twice. We have to do two lookups or insertions, whatever else. Um, it's way faster to just do it in a single operation. Um, again, this is the kind of thing that I would now look at and say, this is super obvious, but I had no idea that the API worked this way um, uh, when I first wrote this function. Um, 
another thing we can do, which is this one's like, I don't, know, I don't want to call it free, but like um, you can use uh, faster hash functions. Uh, so this is a little strange because I was using B tree set, um, which I don't, I don't really want to go into the details, but that that's part of the standard library, but Rust also has a hash set um, and they're subtly different, but there are uh, Rust's default hash set uses a hash function that is not um, optimized for performance per se. Um, and the reason for that is that um, uh, it is more resistant to uh, collisions and uh, other kinds of problems that might be associated with hashing. Um, and there are other hash functions that you can use that are much faster, um, especially when you're dealing with uh, small keys. So if you're dealing with like integer keys and things like that, uh, FX hash set in F and FX hash map are what we use pretty much everywhere in Rust, And I believe Rust C, the Rust compiler itself uses FX hash set because in the context of a compiler, the things that you care about with the hash function just tend to be very different from what the Rust standard library optimizes for. So using a faster hash function um, can actually provide like very noticeable speed ups um, depending on your data. Um, the other thing we can do is uh, if we, again, I talked about how, um, uh, well, when you insert stuff into a hash, set, a hash map or a hash set, uh, it will periodically has to grow because as you, it starts at a certain size. And then as you insert things, it tends to, to effectively like double whenever you hit the limit. So maybe it starts by having a capacity of one, it allocates for like one spot. And then when you insert something, it doubles to two and then to four and then to eight. That's not exactly how it works, but you can imagine that idea. So the other thing you can do is that if you are, um, if you're creating a hash set and you have a pretty good idea of how many items will be in it, you can actually preset the size um, and uh, you know with this with capacity, it looks scarier than it is, but we're basically saying use the fx hash function and uh, assume that we're going to get basically arguments dot length entries because like I, it wouldn't really matter, but like um, the point is we're probably going to insert arguments dot length items, and so uh, if we tell Rust ahead of time that that's the number of uh, entries that we should expect, it will pre-allocate that capacity um, and avoid a bunch of resizing inside the loop. So uh, uh, again, I'm going to bench. I'm going to I'm going to prove to you that this is actually faster, like with some benchmarks after. But we're just talking through like how I look at this function and think about the things that we could change. So the next one is is also very interesting, a little bit more dramatic of a change, maybe. Um, often when you're working with small sets, it is faster to um, use a vector rather than a hash set. So in, in, uh, in the previous example, this is a totally different function basically, but in the previous example, you're iterating over the arguments. And if you've ever done like a leak code interview or you've ever taken like algorithms or anything like that, you'll immediately think, of course you have to use the hash set. Like it's O of one, you know, it's like constant time insertion and lookup. So we're just iterating over the data. But it actually turns out that if, if you have a small number of items, it can be more efficient to uh, just use the vectors directly. Um, and this is like, this is pretty counterintuitive. Um, uh, and there are different ways to, to think about it. I, I guess like the simplest would be that um, for a hash set, for example, to iterate over it, you often typically, depends on the implementation of it, but a couple of different things could be going on. So one, um, the entries may not be stored in contiguous memory. This is a little bit of an advanced topic, but um, I, I think the rush hash set actually is. But um, with a within with a vector, you're guaranteed to be looking at like contiguous blocks of memory. And so when you loop over those, it's very cache friendly because you're just you're you're just moving along in memory um, in a way that's very predictable to to your machine. Uh, whereas with the hash set, like ent entries could be stored anywhere. Again, I don't think this is actually true of the Rust hash hash function, but um, uh, it's just one way of, of thinking about why this could be different. The other thing that is true of the Rust hash function is that, uh, or the hash map, is that the hash map has to iterate over um, empty entries. So I talked about how um, the, the, uh, the hash set or hash map <laughs> will resize periodically over time. 
that means you have a bunch of like free space for new for new things. Um, and so when you iterate over it, uh, I believe that the Rust that Rust implementation has to iterate over uh, those empty entries as well. It knows they're empty, and so it skips them, but it has to go look and check. Um, and so the point is, there's just some amount of overhead, some small amount of overhead, let's say, associated with using a hash map. And counterintuitively, even though this is obviously, this is quadratic, because you're looking at every element compared to every other element, um, counterintuitively, this can like actually be faster if, um, if you're... Uh, if if your n is very small, and we will talk we'll talk about that uh, in a second, um, and then I think there's one more way to improve this that I thought about, which is um, <laughs> oh man, I feel like this is so lame. But basically, when you access a vector in Rust, um, you some the compiler sometimes needs to perform what's called a bounds check. So what's happening here is like. We have arguments and then hard bracket i and then hard bracket. We need to make sure that like that is not an out of bounds access. Um, and so uh, the compiler will insert uh, when it generates assembly, it will insert these bound che bounds checks. So there's some overhead with actually accessing that element because it has to check. Oh, is it actually safe to do this? Okay, I'm gonna now I can do it. And um, and this is so funny because I literally never do this and I see people do it in talks uh, and I had to do it myself. But basically, if you put this function into uh, into the compiler and look at the generated assembly, you can see on lines like 240 and 257 on the right, we have these panicking panic bounds checks. So you can actually see in the generated code that the Rust compiler um, or sorry, I guess the runtime, whatever, is having to do these bounds checks in order to do that. And that is that is slower than if we didn't have to do the bounds checks. Um, so one way to avoid bounds checks in general is to use the iterator API. So if you've seen Rust's iterator API, um, this is like the exact same logic, but we're just writing it in terms of an iterator. So we're saying enumerate over the items and then uh, skip the first i plus one items and compare them. So we've rewritten the same thing, but instead of doing array accesses, uh, we're using iterators. And iterators generally are uh, maybe always, I don't know, they're able to avoid the bounds check. So you can actually, we should expect this to be faster than the previous version, um, uh, which is cool. There's other ways to get the compiler to avoid bounds checks, but I'm not smart enough to like know what those are, how to do them. Like basically like you can still do accesses and sometimes the compiler can know that it's actually safe and get rid of those. But I don't really know like what the conditions are in which that's true. All right, so we talked through seven different versions of this function, and now we're just going to look at the numbers for how they perform. So um, I think I used six arguments, which even felt like the on the higher side of maybe of how many a function would typically have. But we're looking at um, uh, a vector or a slice of six arguments. So uh, I benchmarked this with Criterion. So this is the original version. It's 314 uh, nanoseconds. Uh, just getting rid of the allocation, that's the first thing we fixed. We got rid of the allocation. Just getting rid of the allocation cuts it um, about in half to 144. Uh, so that's already like a great improvement. Um, uh, the next thing we did was we combined the contains and the insert into a single operation. That cuts it down another I guess that's like a third of the 144. I don't know, I can't do the math. We went from 314, 144, and 98. Um, the next thing we did was we moved to FX hash, hash set. So I said, we're gonna use a faster hash function. That actually got a little bit slower. So now we went from 98 to 103. That, that's probably within noise. You could call it like the same, but it wasn't a big improvement. The next thing we did was we pre-allocated the hash set size because we knew how many arguments we'd have. That's a pretty dramatic improvement. So that goes to 57. So again, 98, and then it went up to 103, and now we're down to 57. As a reminder, we started at 314. So we went from 314 to 57 just by uh, changing out the hash set, uh, sorry, changing out the hash function, pre-allocating, removing allocations, um, combining the insertion and the contains. So this is like, this is the fastest version of that, that uses the hash set that we will see, um, 57. Uh, nanoseconds, so it's like six times faster. Just from, we didn't change anything about the API, we just changed how we're working with the data. So as a reminder, the next example is gonna be the arrays. 
So the arrays for six arguments is 21 nanoseconds. So it's actually like quite a bit faster than the hash set. Um, uh, and uh, I guess looking at now, it's not just that the, about the iteration, it's also that we don't have to build the hash set itself. So we don't actually have to allocate that space for the hash set because we're just iterating over the, um, the arrays. Uh, but we went from 57 to 21. So that's like, again, that's like pretty dramatic. Now we're down from like 350 or whatever to 21, which is a really big difference. Um, and then finally, we had the bounds check and we moved over to using iterators. And so that again, that went to 19. So we went from 21 to 19, which is small, but that's a 10%. Uh, that's like a 10% improvement because we're, we're now dealing with smaller numbers. Um, so it actually is a noticeable uh, improvement. Um, Funny thing is, I did this with six arguments. If you go up to like a, th I, I then went up to a thousand arguments, <laughs> and the array-based version is um, starts to be, I think, at a thousand arguments, it's a hundred times slower than the hash set-based version. So, like we saw here, oh, we can use if we just iterate over the arrays, it's like three times faster. But that stops being true if you have large numbers of items. So uh, there's a lot of I think there's like a bunch of like specific and like maybe higher level lessons in like walking through this function. Um, but, I, you know, a couple of things I would say, uh, like always avoiding allocations, just like, I, I just like always avoid allocations and you always want to avoid allocations. It's much better not to copy, not to make copies and not to work with own values if you don't have to. That's the very first change we made. Um, and that's just like table stakes for um, like thinking in Rust, in my opinion. It's like, you're always thinking about ownership, like who owns the data, and you're trying to avoid having to create copies. Um, avoiding unnecessary work, we like just knowing the APIs, we removed that contains insert into a single insert. That's just knowing the APIs better. Um, uh, and then like thinking, knowing your data and like using the right things for your data and benchmarking are like both extremely critical because I, I showed you here, like these are benchmarks, but they're benchmarks on a very specific, uh, you know, small numbers of arguments. Um, and if you were to go take this and put this in production somewhere, and then you don't realize that actually most people have like a thousand arguments to their function, then uh, you're gonna ship something that's like really, really slow. And so what is actually the best way to do something? Like what's the fastest way to do something? It actually totally depends on your data sometimes. Um, and we, we don't do this, by the way, we use the hash set version because I think it's, this difference to me is not that, not nearly as important, uh, like 57 versus 20 or whatever. And this will scale to like arbitrary sizes. Um, so we don't actually do this, but like we, I guess in some places we do say we're going to use a vector instead of a hash set because it's faster and it's going to be really small. But like in general, we don't, this is not like a rule of thumb for us. But my point is like, what's going to be fast this, you really you have to like think about what the data world workloads and you have to benchmark because um, it, it, the answer to like which of these is the fastest is just like, it, it depends. It, it's like with every problem you've ever worked on in, in programming, like it, what's better, like it depends. Um, how am I doing on time? Can I keep going? I know we're over. I look, I look to you, Alan. Thumbs up, keep going for a couple of more minutes. Okay. All right. So we're not going to go into this much detail in any more examples. I saw this was a really, really good example because I looked at this function and I just felt totally differently about it. Um that and I probably um but let's talk about a couple other these will be much smaller. We're not going to go through like huge, huge examples. I'm just going to talk about a couple of things that are kind of interesting. Um, and I have a lot of them and I probably won't get through all of them. Um, so one thing we do in Rough is we use, we swap out the allocator. We use a custom allocator um, that basically looks like this. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do this on like all of your projects. Again, you should benchmark it and see what the impact is because it it can, it is the case, you can see from the benchmarks here that using a custom allocator uh, actually like greatly improved performance for us. Um, but uh, whether that, that may not be true on your project. Like you have to benchmark it because I'm not an expert in like which allocator you should use and when, but my understanding is that they all have different strengths and weaknesses. And it doesn't always make sense depending on the patterns of your tooling or your library to like use a custom allocator. Um, it also comes with the costs. Uh, it's like more code size, probably a larger binary, um, like more dependencies. So 
Uh, this is not like a free thing, but um, I have seen other tools do this. We do this to great success. It's never caused any issues at all. Um, and it improved performance a bunch, which is very cool. Um, so uh, it's crazy that Russ lets you, it's crazy to me that Russ lets you do this. Um, but anyway, we have, uh, we use a custom allocator that made Ruff a lot faster, kind of cool. Um, all right, here's another like, here's another fun one um, that is maybe more complex than is, then it's going to be worth it given how little time I'm going to spend on it. But um, so we have this frequent thing where um, we need a representation for um, like a path to, let's say like a function in a Python project. So imagine like the dot separated path, like foo.bar dot baz or whatever, like the thing you would import. We need some representation of that path. Um, and uh, the way that we do that is we use like a slice or a vector to represent it. So we have like a slice of the first element would be foo, the second element would be bar, the third element would be baz. And we kind of like use those everywhere. Um, it's, it's kind it turns out that it's kind of expensive to be creating and destroying vectors like that so much and so frequently um, because you're, you're just doing a lot of heap allocations. So you're like, like, let's say we're doing this like 10,000 times and we're just like churning these heap allocations. We're like creating and destroying objects really, really quickly. There are a bunch of libraries out there that do very interesting and clever things for vectors and vectorized data. Um, what, the one that we use is called smallvec and um, it's pretty interesting. So basically the way it works is um, when you have a vector, like you don't know how big it's gonna be. So you wanna put it on the heap because it might grow eternally and you can't fit all that the stack has like a limited size and you just can't be like putting arbitrary amounts of data into the stack. So you typically, when you have like a vector or anything that's gonna grow in like an unbounded way, you wanna put it on the heap. Smallvec lets you put <laughs> arrays or vectors on the stack up to a certain size. So it basically, uh, it basically means that if you're creating small enough vectors and you put some kind of cap on the size that you're willing to tolerate, um, you can just put them on the stack, which is way faster if you're just creating and deleting them constantly. So we moved those representations from actual Rust vector, standard library vectors to small vec, and it made rough the entire rough project like 10% faster, which is crazy. I mean, it goes to show you that we are creating way too many of these, and I have like that's like a totally separate problem of like why we are creating this thing so many times. Um, but this is kind of cool. This is like, uh, the lesson here is not you should go and use small vec everywhere because uh, again, it depends on your data. You need to look at like how you are using what um, and go benchmark on real workloads. Like we only use small vec in this, for this one struct. We don't use it like throughout the code base. Um, and there are a bunch of reasons for that. Like it's faster if you're creating and deleting a ton of um, vectors, but it turns out it's actually slower in a lot of cases because you have this overhead of asking, okay, I want item number three. Is that on the stack of the heap? So there's some overhead associated with it. There's like, there's no, there's no free win, right? If this was like the, always the best thing, then it would probably be the standard. Um, but there are lots of things you can do if you think hard about like, where are you spending time? Um, there are clever data structures that you can use that take advantage of these ideas around memory and allocation and heap and stack. Um, and so we actually saw like a huge improvement from this, um, which is awesome. Um, this is just the crate. I don't know why I include this slide. I just talked about it a bunch. Um, okay, this is another kind of fun one. I already talked about the call path thing. So this is like a path to a symbol, um, like foo bar baz or like, um, I don't know if you've, I don't know how many people have ever written much Python, but like, um, I don't know, collections.default dict, that would be like collections, then default dict, that would be like the call path. So it tries to represent basically a unique identifier to some symbol in, in Python or in, in your project. Um, and we need to match on these things like all the time. Like if we're trying to figure out if like a function call is, um, let's say we're trying to figure out if it's a specific function call, like actually you're initializing a default dict. That means for every call in your program, we need to see if that call path matches default dict. So we're just like constantly checking against these things. Um, and the way that we used to do this, which in hindsight is, I guess, kind of stupid. Well, 
I guess I'm just saying that because it improved performance a lot, but like it's more intuitive to do it this way. So the red is what we used to do. So if it was like, okay, we need to know whether a function call is a blocking HTTP call. So if it's call path matches any of these, then it's a blocking HTTP call. And then we would do is we'd iterate over this list and say like, do any of them equal the current call path? Because that data is static, we can actually just write that as a match statement. So this is the exact same lookup, um, but written as a match statement. So if you look at the top here, there's like, we're only really looking at like three modules, like HTTPX, requests, and URLM. Um, and so I've just taken that same thing and rewritten it as a match statement. Uh, because the, the, because that 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 data is static, it doesn't change. This is like way faster if you're doing it a lot um, for a bunch of reasons. Like one, it doesn't have to do nearly as much work because you're just you just match on the first piece, and if it's not request, there's no reason to check. Like here, we're checking request.get. Even if the first part is not request, we're going to end up checking all these, right? Um, so the match statement lets us short circuit and uh, um, skip like a ton of work. Um, and, uh, the Rust compiler also like is very good about optimizing these kinds of things. So, um, when we, again, this improved performance on a rough by like 10%, that's crazy. Like we did this, we did this in a bunch of places. It wasn't just this one snippet, but we had this pattern like everywhere. Um, and one day I basically realized, wow, we're spending like a lot of time, like doing these checks. And I just rewrote them all as match statements and it made a huge impact. Um, so I don't know what the lesson is here for me. It was like just thinking hard about what's static and what's dynamic because we can't structure the code this way if these are like user provided functions, for example. Um, uh, like we can't write a match statement if like the user is providing a bunch of configuration options that specify these, but if they're hard coded, like let's take advantage of the fact that they're hard coded to like speed things way up. Um, uh, this is like a really, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say any of these are like obvious or beginner ones. I guess I can because they're all mistakes I made. But um, and so I feel comfortable like saying that. But like uh, this is you have the same problem in Python and I think in other languages too. But compiling a regular expression actually has like a non-trivial cost. And so here we were compiling this for every single line in the program because for, we were running projects over every single line in the program. And so we were compiling it for every single line in the program. Compiling it once with this lazy construct. Um, I don't know, it improved performance, let's see, yeah, 10 times from like 253 milliseconds to 222 milliseconds. It's like a huge importance improvement. Um, better than that, avoid regular expressions. If you like really, really care about performance, don't use regular expressions at all if you can avoid it. Um, this is like another thing that we've done a couple of times. I don't even wanna go through the details of what happened here, but like basically we had a regular expression for identifying suppression comments. These are like little comments that you add to say like, ignore this violation, ignore this violation, ignore this violation. And I got rid of the regex and rewrote it with just some like handwritten, um, I don't know what you'd call it. It's like lexer code, like parser code. It's just doing the same thing, but it's kind of unrolled. Um, and this is like way faster. Um, and the Ru like Rust regular expression crate is extremely good. It's like very high performance, but um, but regular expressions are super powerful. Like they're really dynamic. They can do a lot and they can't always take advantage of, um, things you like know to be true in the patterns or thing or things that you know to be true in your data. Um, and so, uh, sometimes rewrite it. If you have like a very simplistic pattern, like here, I know that it always has to contain, uh, this like no QA thing. So the way it works is we look for those no QAs and then just try to see if it's part of a comment as opposed to running a regular expression. Um, so again, you should not go and remove all your regular expressions. We still have a bunch in ref, but like if you have hot paths that are running regular expressions and the pattern matching is very simple, um, regular expression might be overkill and you can actually get better performance by not using it, despite the fact that the regular expression crate is extremely good and can identify some of these optimizations internally. Uh, I'll skip this, let's see. What else, is, what else is interesting? Um, this is very interesting, but do I have time to talk about it? Uh, okay, I'll talk about this one because I really like it, but the, I promise this will be kind of the last one. Um, so um, if you have like a Python file and you're like looking at some source code, there's let's say you have like a function like def foo or whatever. There's two ways to think about like the location of that function. 
One is the row or the line and column number. And that's what we as humans tend to think about, right? It's like, oh, this function is located on line four um, and it's indented four spaces. So it's like line four, column four, or depending on whether you're zero or one indexing. Um, so that's like the human representation of how we think about like where something is in the program. The other way to think about it is uh, the offset of that code in the in the string. So um, if you have like a big string of source code um, and you want to know like where the function, if and you want to like grab the, the source code for that function, knowing the row and column is like pretty unhelpful <laughs> because um, because to find line four, you have to basically parse the entire, you have to look through for all the line endings. So like, you know, if I gave you a string, a, rust, a string in Rust, and I was like, hey, go grab me the function that's on line four, uh, column six, or whatever. That's going to be pretty expensive because you need to iterate over the entire string, find the new line. So, okay, I found the first new line. Okay, I found the second. Okay, I found the third. Okay, now I'm going to eat like four characters. That's a pretty expensive way to like do string slicing. Um, and that's actually what we used to do in Rough. So in Rough, all of our AST, all the nodes that we worked with used rows and columns because that's what... Um, I mean, this because it's how humans think about like location, um, and and we need them when we report diagnostics. So if we tell you that there's an unused import, you don't want to know like the byte offset of that unused import because it doesn't mean anything to you. You want to know the row and column. So uh, originally, Ruff's uh, syntax tree used these rows and columns everywhere, and Mika uh, changed it so that the syntax nodes all store these byte offsets, um, and uh, it's good for uh, a lot of reasons. Um, uh, basically, it means that when we need to extract source code, we can do it for free. There's no, we don't spend any time like counting new lines. Um, we just say, oh, we need the, we need this function. Okay, it's from bytes 100 to 150, and that's an O of one operation. We just slice into the string, um, and it turns out we do that way more than we report diagnostics, right? Like we report the diagnostics to the user because we still have to translate back to the wrong column, right, to tell the user. This is line four, column four. So we still have to like do the inverse operation, but we do that like one time at the end of the program. And most files don't have any violations. So for most files, we don't even have to do that. So it turns out that uh, using byte offsets throughout rough and then translating to row and column at the end was way more efficient. This was like, I can't, I don't know, I guess I, there's like, Mika has like amazing benchmarks in this PR because he's like so good at, being extremely thorough, <laughs> um, but I guess I lost them. Um, but uh, I, this was like a 20% improvement or something like that. Um, it was like a, a really dramatic improvement. Um, the other thing, I guess the other lesson here is like, here we're storing a row and column as two U32 bit integer, U32 integers. A byte offset, we just store one U32. So it sounds really small, but we're actually storing, we have to store one of these for every single thing in the source code, every single token. And so cutting that amount of memory that's required there in half, um, also valuable. But the real thing is thinking about uh, like, what are you doing a lot? Like what's expensive and like how often are you doing it? Um, and inverting that pattern here made like an enormous impact. Um, so just thinking about the way you structure your data, the things you're doing a lot, the things you're doing sparingly, what can you afford to be expensive? What can you afford to be cheap? And then ultimately like benchmarking very rigorously to understand it. Um, Okay, last thing I'll mention, and this is the opposite. This is a change we made that actually made Ruff a lot slower <laughs> um, intentionally. So in, yes, okay. So uh, in Rust, you can set your release builds to have this like panic abort uh, property, which uh, is sort of a cheat code to make your Rust program a lot faster um, because it means that uh, if you panic, if you do something that's like super illegal, um, your program just crashes and it doesn't really, it doesn't tell you like what happened or where you crashed and why. It doesn't have like a trace or anything like that. Um, so that makes your programs faster because the, um, well, I can't speak to the exact reasons because I'm not an expert in that, but like, for example, it doesn't have to do a bunch of bookkeeping to like, un to be able to play that trace back, back to the user. It can just, um, uh, it just like decides to fail and like, okay, that's fine. The whole program failed and crashed. Um, and so if you enabling panic equals abort uh, makes your program a lot faster, but for us, it comes at a cost, which is that if people's programs panic, 
there's no way for us to handle that gracefully. Like we can't like show them a message that says like rough crashed, please file an issue. We're really sorry. Like here's the trace, include these things. Um, instead the rough would just crash and just get some scary message. That's like seg fault or whatever. And you'd be like, okay, this is a bad experience. So we, I did this change initially because I was like, oh, I want rough to be as fast as possible. And this is the thing I can do to make it fast. And we ended up rolling it back. Um, and we regressed, we regressed performance by about 15% so that we could show users panics. So we could catch and show users panics. Um, and that to me is a really good trade-off. Um, but this is just to say that like, sometimes you do things to make the program faster, but you've got to think about the big picture. Like not every optimization is worth it. And to me, being able, a 15% performance regression is actually worth it for being able to give users a good experience when we make big mistakes and tell them like, file an issue, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but maybe someday we'll get so confident in Ruff's performance that we will, we will be very confident that we will never panic and then we get a free 15% win. That's the way to look at it because um, we'll, we'll do this again. Um, okay, that's everything I had. You got two really pretty slides at the start and the end and then all the rest is keynote defaults. But I hope that uh, I hope that made some sense. I'd love to, um, uh, not now, I guess, but you know, please reach out to me um, on Twitter or on our Discord. Um, and I'd actually really love to get feedback on like the things that you thought were interesting in this talk, the things that where I moved like way too fast, um, uh, the things I should have gone deeper on, the things that just like were really boring. Because again, um, I prepped all this over the weekend. This is entirely new material. I've never presented any of this before. Um, and I think I see like inklings of things that could be great talks. I'm sure it's not there yet, uh, but I know I'm trying to cover a lot. So um, uh, I genuinely mean I just really love feedback. If you you know reach out, message me, tell me what you liked, what you didn't like, um, and um, I can probably stick around. I, I know we're way over time, so you're definitely welcome to to cut us off. I can probably stick around for like fifteen minutes ish. Fairly, you should be able to unmute yourself now. I think we have a couple of questions as well. Cool. Oh, you can. Great. Sorry about that. It's a Linux thing, not a Zoom thing. Uh, the first question, I have a couple of questions here from P and from F Diego. But first, people are asking me what the benchmark tool that you used was. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so for which part? Well, there's a bunch of different ones. So we use, um, OK, so this tool here uh, is called Hyperfine. Um, this is just the actual PR from something that I showed in the talk. Um, this is called Hyperfine. It's a it's just a generic benchmarking tool, as in it'll benchmark anything that you can run on the CLI. Um, so you say like, and here we're benchmarking, excuse me, a release build. So run the release build and then just uh, sorry, make the release build and then just run the release build directly. Um, yeah, Hyperfine, really, really good tool. Um, you can use it, again, for benchmarking pretty much anything. Oh, also, random comment. I guess this probably gets said a lot, but um, it's never it's never worth benchmarking debug builds um, in Rust. You always need to benchmark release builds because the, the performance characteristics are completely different. And release builds are like 10 to 100 times faster than debug builds. Rust is like very, very heavily optimized towards fast um, release builds like at the cost of other things. So like Rust compile times are really long in general. And that's kind of, a, that. my understanding is that's basically an intentional decision because you can, they do more optimization passes, blah, blah, blah. So like in Rust, the release builds are like the thing that you really care about. And so anyway, don't, don't benchmark debug builds. You will like be confused and you will see confusing results. Always benchmark release builds, which is really sad because it means to benchmark, you need to do a bunch of release builds and release builds are, are uh, take a long time. Um, but sorry, this is Hyperfine. Um, the other thing that we use for, this is for like, we want to benchmark all of rough on like these two code bases. The other thing we use is a tool called Criterion, which is pretty popular, um, which, which is more, which we more use for micro benchmarks. So this will, um, this again, this is actually a Rust, this is a Rust crate and we like define the functions we want to benchmark and then it, it runs them and it gives you like really, really good data um, on like how different it was. Is it statistically significant? Like, I don't know if I can find the output, but the output's very pretty. Um, so yeah, we use Hyperfine and we use Criterion um, as our two benchmarking tools. So someone, uh, Elena Critic, uh, said, if I remember correctly, Ruff uses a custom fork of Rust Parthens parser for tokenizing and parsing. 
by saying that there's a lot of room for improvement at the parsing stage, you mean there's a lot of improve, there's a lot to improve in Rust Python parsers performance. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, uh, there's, I guess for a couple of reasons, like, um, sorry, now I'm like reading, that is like a bunch of interesting questions here. Okay. Arena, do we use arenas? Okay. Um, so, uh, Yes, I think there's a lot of room to improve the um, uh, the Lexer and the parser's performance. We use a fork of the Rust Python parser. We've actually forked it pretty heavily these days. Um, uh, and uh, I think the, the reasons that it can be faster, um, well, intuitively for me, it's like two things. It's like one, um, we have just like, we have much more of an explicit performance goal with regards to parsing and lexing, whereas Rust Python is a project um, that they have very different goals. Like the goal of Rust Python is to build a Python interpreter, <laughs> and so like um, the parser and the lexer is like one piece of a full Python interpreter. And so um, part of it's just intuitively that like um, what Rust needs like for the output of the AST. Um, are very different. And I think that if we look at the parser and the lexer from that perspective and from a very performance oriented perspective, I just kind of believe that there's room to optimize it because it hasn't been fully optimized. Um, I guess one example of that is the byte offset thing. So, you know, we're storing rows and columns and now we're storing byte offsets. The row and column thing, that was actually like a much more amenable representation for Rust Python because like they didn't really care about the byte offsets doesn't really help them that much when they're as an interpreter. Um, whereas for us, we're constantly like slicing source code and like manipulating it and stuff like that. Um, so that's an example where like the design of the AST, what was optimal for the tools was just a little different and, um, we could build something that was more performant for what we wanted. Um, the other thing is the Rust, Rust Python's parser uses a par parser generator, um, which is, which is totally cool, but I tend to believe that we could, if we were willing to ha sort of hand write more of the parser, that we could probably optimize it more to our use case because a parser generator is a very general thing. It needs to be able to generate like lots of parsers and like we can take advantage of like the structure of the AST in different ways. So uh, I do think there's a lot of room to improve the performance there. Um, and we've actually like have some pretty interesting PRs that I might've actually been merged by now, but I kind of don't want to like, uh, I don't want to like blow up Mika by like showing those PRs because like, uh, but we've we've already improved it quite a bit I think over the course of the past few days and I I think we can improve a lot more. Um, does Rough use arenas? Uh, no, we don't use arenas um, for AST nodes. Uh, we might in the future, um, but we don't right now. Um, we tend to, uh, yeah, we don't use arenas right now. I, I kind of want to, I want to explore doing that in the future. Um, there's like a lot of other small things that we can do for the AST that we could get into. Like um, we could talk about like enum sizes, like boxing variants is something that people do a lot. This probably sounds like total gibberish if you haven't like written a lot of Rust, but like the size of an enum in general is like, is roughly the size of its largest variant. Um, and so, if you have like one really big variant, um, then no matter what you instantiate, you're paying that memory cost every time you allocate it. And so you can think about ways to reduce the size of, of your objects and all that kind of stuff. Um, sorry, I'm kind of going off, off script. At work, we get more questions after closing the recording. <laughs> um, actually, I was just realizing this is the criterion output, by the way. Um, so I talked about criterion before, but the, but it'll be in your terminal and it'll have nice colors, not like this. Um. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, so for yeah. for performance uh, analysis, have you used tools like Valgrind or Flame uh, things, or uh, have you used something that would give you like per kind of call um, performance statistics, like something and things like that? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I use... Um... Yes, I use instruments because I'm on Mac OS, um, but uh, we have actually have instructions. I mean, if anyone's ever trying to figure out like how to benchmark <laughs> their Rust project with like, uh, I can't remember if it's called flame graph or perf graph or whatever, um, 
or instruments or whatever. We actually have instructions in our contributing .md. They're probably more generic than um, than just applying to rough around like how we use those tools. Um, those are really useful. That's like a whole skill set in itself and something I would like to get better at, like learning how to actually use those tools. Um, and I'm starting to get better with instruments at actually looking at the flame graphs and like digging into specific functions um, and trying to understand like what's inlined and how do I understand improvement. But um, yes, that's also like, um, that's also a very valuable practice um, and probably something I'd like to do more of, but I'm still trying to like get good at those tools. Actually, speaking of, um, since we're sort of on the topic of Python as well, there's a there's a version of Flame Graph called uh, for Python called PySpy, which I found very useful. Oh yeah, I think I think PySpy is written in Rust. Yes, it is. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a cool project. Alan's microphone's packed up, so yeah, you you can do signing. I, I can't read inside, so I can't tell anyone what you said. Um, but yeah, th thank you very much. That was a, that was a an excellent talk. Um, very enlightening. Very. Uh, it's. A, I mean, it's a great project. It's lovely to hear from you know, from someone who's written at such a, a high profile and very widely used project. Yeah. I yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, this is this is this is really fun for me. Um, I I I really I really appreciate it. Um, I hope hope it wasn't like too high level and then too low level or anything like that. Um, like I said, very open to, if you want to DM me things that you liked, things that you thought were interesting would be helpful for me in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me on and for uh, everyone for sticking around, listening, asking great questions. Yeah, you yeah. Don't, it doesn't have to be written in Rust to be a cool project, by the way. But uh, this sort of like, this like Rust Python, like hybrid community, I think is like, it exists, but it's pretty nascent. Like there's other, there's some other projects in Python that are that leverage Rust in interesting ways, um, and so I just like to champion those projects because I think I at least believe that Rust could be a big part of um, of Python's future. Um, and so uh, I like tools like PySpy. But yeah, I am biased in that I will probably think something's cooler if it's written in Rust, but um, uh, it's not a strict requirement. <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. Well, thanks everyone, yeah. and thanks uh, have a great evening. Thank you very much. You too. Thanks very much. Take care.